Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. Thank you very much. Um, one of the luxuries of aging is a, a group of people will actually gather to allow you to think out loud. And I, I, I thank you in advance, but I, I know it isn't completely my charisma and my intelligence because it's so damn cold outside <laughs> that this is a safe, warm haven. Uh, my odyssey began a couple of years ago. Um, I was one of those kids in American high schools who didn't know what he wanted to be when he or she grows up. And so I enlisted in the Army, was trained as a medical and dental technician, ended up at Walter Reed, and found myself working on making faces for victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and a respect for the remarkable world of prosthetics. Um, at that time, surgery had not yet caught up with methyl methacrylate and being able to make zygomatic uh, plastic appliances. It was like the beginning of potato doll uh, technology. Um, it has come, it has come uh, a long way. Uh, as a dental student, um, uh, faculty came in different flavors, uh, probably like is still the case. And there were a few faculty who I had an affinity towards and who were just unconditionally supportive. Uh, people like Dick Grulick and Marsh Robinson and Bob Gregg. Bob Gregg was in anatomy and Marsh Robbins was a DDS MD oral maxillofacial surgeon and Dick Grulick was a PhD and the opportunities that they created for a precocious dental student were just wonderful. And so through those associations, um, as a dental student, I got the thrill, the ego buzz of seeing my name on a piece of paper with other names and it being in the so-called literature. Now, for some people, they can do this and they move on. I have never outgrown this phenomenon of trying to be able to contribute to shaping what is thought and eventually what will be taught uh, in the future in whatever area uh, might be the case. And so with the right mentoring and the right coaching and the right enabling steps, I was led to believe by immigrant mother and father that this was America and anything was possible. And so that energized and allowed lots of things to happen. Now, we've been talking today. Um, I came from my village of Los Angeles yesterday, and I've had the, really the privilege of meeting with PhD students who are in progress here, and dental students, and some faculty, and old friends, and, and met some new friends. And in the course of that, we shared the small talk of academics that we have come to realize that academic medicine and academic dentistry are endangered activities and require an influx of curious, engaged people to amplify against all of the possibilities. So as you think about Ann Arbor and you think about the role of the University of Michigan in the larger world, it is obvious to all of us that people are moving migrations more than ever before in history. A million people today flew each way across the Pacific. A million people today flew each way across the Atlantic. In milliseconds, our speech, our images, our text can move around the world vis-a-vis -vis the internet at speeds unheard of and can shape cultures in ways uh, never known before. I was born in this country at the end of the Depression. Life expectancy in 1938, the year I was born, life expectancy in the United States was 53 years old. Social Security was invented with the idea that no one would live to be 65. Medicare in the 60s was crafted at 65 because it was clear 
that the demographics would indicate that human beings would tend to demise in the sixth decade of life. Today we have more people in the cohort reaching 80 and above than ever before in human history. A child born today, and I don't know why, where this data actually comes from, but it's coming to me via the CDC, a young baby born today has a life expectancy of 92 years of age. So in the last half of the 20th century, and in the early part of the 21st century, in the industrial countries of the world, the possibilities have completely changed. The opportunities, the social issues, the economic issues, and dentistry, and dental education, and how we learn, and how we teach, and what we do have remarkably changed as well. So I want to convince you, and obviously with Research Day it takes no convincing, that if you just glance at the last half century, science is the fuel that goes into the engine of technology and radically changes the world, often irreversibly. And here are just some uh, small examples of stages in scientific development that have radically changed the human condition as we know it. Now, this is a book that uh, I was coached to learn about through one of my colleagues, Chuck Schuler, and some of the people here at the University of Michigan. Uh, it's called How People Learn. By reading this, I, the book came out in 99, I saw an advanced copy in 98, and it profoundly changed my life and my view of higher education. And there is a science, and in the future, I believe increasingly more and more people in medical, dental, pharmacy education will rethink and then revise our curriculum, our sequencing, our assessments, those kind of activities. This is a direct image from that book, and it highlights the various ways that we come to know and how we learn. It also points out that passive learning, sitting in a room such as this, is the most inferior form of higher education, but rather active, engaged, small group, case-based, problem-based, inquiry-based, hands-on, need-to-know types of learning uh, is the hallmark of how adults want to learn and learn the best. So we understand that the science of understanding, this is cognitive neurosciences, uh, clinical psychology and education, some of the educational literature clearly indicate that the learning process is becoming better known, better understood, and then the opportunity of applying it in higher education like dental education, medical, and, and, and so forth. It is clear, and this is from one of your gifted faculty, that there are several ways to think of dental education. I was educated in the upper model. Uh, there were requirements. You do uh, 1,624 XYZ procedures. You memorize whatever is needed. Uh, you pass a state board on a live patient, and you are then immunized for the rest of your life against ignorance in your profession. Then along came regulatory agencies said we were required to take some continuing education courses, and so we go to Hawaii or Alaska or Ann Arbor, <laughs> and we learn about a variety of things in continuing education. Clearly, faculty here and around the world would love to fully integrate knowledge be able to have the why and how underneath factoids and lead to people with critical thinking, self-assessment, and a passion for lifelong learning. Now, while that is going on, the clinical realities of a dental school, we now know without any conditional uh, qualifiers that oral health begins prior to birth. It extends through the entire lifespan through hospice care, and so dental education and all of the related features goes from prenatal development and issues and maternal care and know-how and prenatal supplements and all of that stuff all the way through quality of life issues, medically compromised, and all the way to hospice care. Um, we know that technology enhances treatment planning and coordinating and, and giving us some of those backgrounds. 
Many of us in dentistry, and I was shocked when we worked on the Surgeon General's report and traveled around the country and worked with experts and got all of this data together and finally published the Surgeon General's report, Oral Health in America, in May of 2000, we really, as a profession, didn't clearly arti articulate that the number one chronic infection of children is tooth decay, that the reason that children do not go to school and, and have less attendance is tooth decay. That tooth decay represents a transmissible infectious disease from mother or caregiver to developing little person. Those ideas and all of the research that goes with it has been around a very long time, but we have not gotten the ears of the governors, senators, House of Representatives, mayors, city councils, large foundations to understand that. So it is an enormously significant issue. And then when there are periapical abscesses, either maxilla or mandible, last year we had two deaths of two kids who died of bacterial meningitis, and in the case of one of them, they actually did cultures and were able to identify from the cultures strep mutans. Lactobacillus acidophilus, uh, forsythus, and some of these microbes that are never found in the central nervous system, but were loaded in the brain tissue of this young man who passed away at the age 12. Because often you hear the cliche, well, in dentistry nobody dies. Well, they do. And it, they can die of something as preventable as tooth decay. We also know that these abscesses, not only can they go through the maxilla, the thin amount of bone into the brain, but they can also drain through the mandible and eventually through the soft tissue and can be seen like this. Some of the children with who present these um, uh, characteristics in Los Angeles are restless, they're angry, they're agitated, and they're diagnosed as having attention deficit disorder rather than they're running a temperature and they have an abscess. And so there is a need of reconditioning public education K-12. In your village, it would be stretching out to Detroit to revisit the knowledge base and awareness of a lot of folks who work in public education. Then along came um, this incredible, it's been around for 50 years, but all of the upgrades from Brandon Mark and the ability to do implants and open up a whole array of, of technologies. We know that the mouth contains uh, as many microbes as there are people on the planet Earth. Six billion microbes are found in the oral cavity. They can be symbiotic and sort of just around, or they can become virulent and highly significant. When we finished the Surgeon General's report, and I gave a brief presentation at the time to Vice President Gore, giving him the highlights, he was stunned. He was stunned to recognize that the mouth is connected to the rest of the body. That came as a new big idea, and therefore raised the idea, but of course, you can diagnose systemic diseases in the mouth, and of course, an infection in the mouth could end up being in pulmonary tissues or cardiovascular, blah, blah, blah. And as a consequence, uh, some new funding uh, lines opened up. We also know from the work of Jim Beck and Steve Offenbach and uh, Marjorie Jeffcoat and a number of people that low birth weight premature babies often are associated with very major oral infections in the third trimester of pregnancy, and that opened up. And we know that although our country has done marvelous in reducing edentialism in America, uh, when I was born, it was 44% of people 45 and older had no teeth in this country. And today it's 10%. But it's 10% of 300 million people, which is a lot of people without any teeth. We also know with squamous cell carcinoma, something that is enormously relevant if you happen to have it, an American dies every hour of head and neck cancer. We know that the diagnosis is not that radical, but often it is at terminal stages when people are diagnosed. So early diagnosis is an issue, mechanisms are an issue, translational clinical research needs to be achieved, and it has become, and obviously here, 
with the depth and breadth of your faculty and student interest, a very interesting area to pursue on many different uh, levels. We also know that after the head and neck surgery, we leave people sometimes grossly deformed and using implants and plastics, we can do some rehab sorts of stuff and try to paste people back together again. We're aging, higher prevalence of a variety of gender biology disorders, temporomandibular joint, fibromyalgia, those kinds of conditions. And in this country, we're looking at numbers somewhere like 12 million patients, uh, active patients at any given time. Aging has been extraordinary. And the things that we're learning about the brain, probably because of the incredible focus on dementia and for many of us as we slide along through life, the fear is not sometimes to have a walker, it is literally to lose your memory. And your memory is often a great part of who you are. So the investment and the return on the investment with Alzheimer's and other forms of dementia beginning to pay off and hopefully in the near future we will have ways of doing something way in advance of the signs and symptoms in a, in a creative fashion. We also know that the fate of America seems to align with the fate of other industrial countries. If you look at Japan, for example, 25% of the entire Japanese population are over the age of 65. This does not do well towards planning for the future, thinking of the marketplace, thinking of global competition, thinking of investing in early childhood development and those issues. We are moving along, as you can see, and all of the projections that will get to be about between 18 and 22 percent, what saves us in America is immigration and the ability to have a very significant number of people joining us on an annual basis with a net gain of about 1.5 to 2 million people. So we're living in an era, sometimes we pay attention, some less so, to a digital revolution for sure, to a biological revolution for sure, to a health care, health management, health cost crisis recognized by more people than ever before. And we have the emergence of nanotechnology, informatics, so-called bioinformatics, that allows us to integrate, synthesize, revisit data sets as never before in human history. In the words of Bob Dylan, the times they are a changing. So stem cells, nanotechnology, haptics, the ability for preclinical dental education to move into the world of sensory, computer enhanced sensory, fine neuromuscular activities, very exciting prospects on the horizon. Synthetic bi biology as modeled by Craig Venter, who just created a fantastic microorganism that loves to live on fuel, hydrocarbons, and another strain of bug that he's created which produces methane as a biofuel. And so there are some exceedingly exciting advances in the field of synthetic biology. Biomimetics, learn from biology and then apply it to some of these prosthetic problems is alive and well and, and Michigan is one of the major sources of inspiration in this area. And then hap maps and SNPs and the derivatives in which every issue of nature, every issue of science, every issue of the New England Journal of Medicine have one or more articles focusing on the application of that technology. Here's an example from Craig Venter's team of being able to produce synthetically, starting with ACT and Gs, make synthetic cassettes, assemble the cassettes, and put in the equivalent of one chromosome into a synthetic bacteria and be able to drive that from an engineering point of view. So in my lifetime, and some of yours, we walked through karyotyping in the 1950s, uh, genomics uh, uh, currently and in the last uh, decade plus, proteomics today, 
metabolomics today, pharmacogenomics today, and biomimetics and tissue engineering blossoming at the moment, and all of the informatics that are related. And of course, this is just a hint of the possibilities of human curiosity and human imagination. These two guys basically fueled on no NIH money, no foundation money, uh, just beer, the, the, the fumes of beer, were able to put their little tinker toy set together, steal blatantly the gifted ideas of Rosalind Franklin, convert them into this cockamamie model, write a one-page paper in Nature published in 1953, and all of a sudden, the beginning of this biological revolution was really framed and much obscure. Leroy Stevens, working at Jackson Labs in Maine, coined the term stem cells, working on teratomas in mouse models, ironically published one month later in May of 1953. So the human genome, sort of the politic and the government and the money and big science and so forth, we got together and the decision was made to go for it. And so it went from 1988 and it was completed in October of 2004, but it was basically just a foundation for global genomics and looking at plants and animals and microbes and viruses and a whole host of, of issues. So with the genomic frame of reference, it is possible to either go from a clinical phenotype to a genetic sequence and map it to a chromosome, or blindly find out through some of the rules of modern human genetics what is the beginning promoter region and enhancer region and understanding stop codons, and that means stop of genes, be able to figure out the absolute number of genes found in the human mitochondria. There are nine found in the human genome. There are 21,000. So along the way, it was clear that industry and the area of laser technology could make a handshake, and by developing instrumentation, one could begin to take on the human genome, and if you could put out but about 10 to $12 million per human that would be worked up, you could begin to move that agenda. The federal government in this country, as well as eight international partners, came up with the bucks, ponied up, as we said, and went forward and made this all happen. It came in under budget and it came in significantly under cost. You will recall in September of 2005 this amazing excitement, my God, the chimpanzee genome has been done. Let's lay it down, put the human genome next to it, and let's find all of the ways that we are different than these creatures. Well, it turns out that the variance, the, 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 the departure was at the level of 0.1%. The difference between a chimpanzee and a human being is 0.1%, or 3 million base modifications in the human genome. Further, this was done more recently, the Macau, and then laid down and compared to mouse, rat, dog, chimp, human, and Macau, and look at all of the conservation and all of the variance, and again, the variance is remarkably small. So to win the game of being the superior biosystem, it won't be the number of genes or the number of chromosomes, because other creatures have many more. And it isn't just having 21,009 genes encoded in the human genome. The gift is the area that we do not yet know. How do you choreograph, orchestrate, put this information together in various ways, especially in the central nervous system, to give us the attributes of being human? A very exciting next frontier. So here's the human uh, uh, genome looking at the uh, distribution of pseudogenes. These are genes that either are emerging and will become real functional genes, or they are dying and departing genes that were once around and are now being fragmented. But we now know when you take DNA and you stretch it out, about 2% actually is the coding area and the rest of it is a mystery that needs to be uh, discovered, a tremendous opportunity in the future of molecular biology. 
So from 1995, uh, the year that I went to the NIH, uh, Craig Venter was the first who came out with the genome of uh, uh, Haemophilus influenza. And then the genomes just kept getting uh, punched out. We were able to complete dentist genome in 2001. And it was very exciting that we have the same number of genes as lawyers and physicians and so forth. And, and when you look very closely, endodontists and prostodontists, it looks pretty similar. So it was, it was comforting to, uh, to gain that insight. When we look at the entire human condition, the largest genetic variance found between any two human beings on the planet Earth is 0.1%. So words like ethnic cleansing and civil wars over various things are invented as social inventions have nothing to do with the biology uh, as, a, as a reality. And therefore, a real new frontier is how do you reinvent and maybe discard words like ethnicity and race and substitute those with hap maps and snips and so forth. It's going to be politically very interesting turf as it plays out. So we've got 21,009 genes, the nine in the mitochondria, all coming only from our mother. Then we've got the other 21,000. They become uh, transcribed and eventually translated into uh, probably a couple of hundred thousand different proteins, and that represents uh, the name of the game at this time in history. This book, uh, A Life Decoded by Craig Venter, I just urge you, I, I just, I, I, I couldn't put it down. I just had to, just took it in. It is an incredible read. Uh, a guy coming out of high school, lost, didn't know what he was doing kind of thing, went to Vietnam, was a medic, found himself, had an epiphany, then went to UC San Diego, got a bachelor's, then got a PhD, uh, bounced around in academics, couldn't fit in, went to State University of New York, Buffalo, had a problem, ended up in the intramural program at the NIH, and blossomed and then eventually grew out of the NIH, started a company in Rockville, Maryland called Solera, and that was the company that raced the federal government in completing the human genome. He's a very talented guy. And so of his genome, these are um, uh, Craig's defined characteristics that are found in his book. He has blue eyes. Those of us with blue eyes, we have this gene OCA2. Uh, he is addicted to tobacco. He's got this CHRNA6. Um, he has dabbled extensively in substance abuse, um, and he's got that gene. He has a hard time staying up in the day. He's nocturnal, and he has the clock gene, first discovered in Drosophila, confirmed in human beings. Um, he has lactose intolerance, the gene is identified, and he has a high risk for cardiovascular disorders. He's had two heart attacks uh, in his 40s, uh, and uh, this uh, TNFSF4 is a, uh, a liability that he, uh, he carries. Now, this area is just extraordinary. Today, if we could pool together the money for any one of us, we could have our own genome done for about $350,000. but a number of companies, uh, in particular 23andMe and Navigenetics and another company called Decode Genetics are focusing on $1,000 per human genome by 2012. So you can imagine Medicare is going to start reimbursing for doing the human genome for a variety of purposes and our society I think is going to go ballistics with this information base, how to use it, uh, how to protect the individual, how to guide thinking, and so forth, it will be quite interesting. We've also learned, those of us who are more mature adults this afternoon, we used to believe that everything was around Gregor Mendel, and now we know there's a field called non-Mendelian genetics. It works by slightly different rules, and it leads to complex human diseases and disorders, which are far more prevalent than Mendelian inherited diseases, and it is opening up this enormous area. And this website, Genetics Association NADB, hosted at the NIH, is a daily update of the advances being made from HapMaps and SNPs to complex human disorders. A wonderful resource. Along came a very sophisticated atlas of the brain of mouse 
Now there's one coming out of human, and it was uh, counterintuitive uh, to learn that the human brain uses 80% of all of our genes. 80% of all of our genes are used in the human brain. And that opens up the possibility that it is likely that 80% will also be used in the craniofacial complex, making a liver, making a pancreas. It is how they are used. It's sort of like thinking of notes of music and how many melodies can you put together. It is in that kind of thinking. So this has opened up some amazing possibilities. So we've got the human genome, microbial, plant, animal as a driver. We live in a capitalistic country coupled with many global industrial countries, all of them interested in new jobs, being green, uh, advancing all of those sorts of issues. So the human genome goes commercial. And it means coming up with new things to meet the needs of a global marketplace. Diagnostics, therapeutics, biomaterials, imaging devices, uh, uh, monitoring devices of all types and so forth a major, major activity. In the field of dentistry or dental or oral or craniofacial, it is enormously rich with opportunities. And for the students celebrating Research Day, if you look to the future rather than look to the past, the future is oh so glorious in what the opportunities are before you. And these are just examples of the problem areas that will all go forward. In the area of biomimetics to design and fabricate a solution to a particular problem, there is this nexus of the digital and biological revolutions and nanotechnology and clinical dentistry coming, coming together. And so here are some examples. These are four human craniofacial birth defects that have teeth problems in common, either too many teeth, not enough teeth, weirdly shaped teeth, and these become toolbox elements for beginning to think of how can we regenerate a tooth. Uh, people around the world coming together and developing a database. This one is hosted uh, at the University of Helsinki uh, 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 by um, Irma Thesleff and her colleagues. And in it, it shows the genes that are required for the different stages of tooth development as we go from an odontogenic placode to eventually tooth eruption. These are the, the building blocks that one can begin to consider. Uh, a colleague and I, uh, Yang Chai, and I wrote a kind of a cute little paper in, uh, in uh, 2003 on prospects for tooth regeneration in the 21st century, and we came up with this model for using stem cells from enamel organ epithelium and dental papilla mesenchyme, putting them together and generating teeth, and ironically, it's been done and published, and uh, the prototype is now uh, uh, available. Uh, in the area of bioceramics, whether it's enamel, cementum, dentine, or bone, incredible progress being made. Uh, the genes for enamel, they've been identified and cloned and sequenced and expressed. Uh, uh, some really neat ideas around the world on enamel bioceramics. Some of the work, obviously, by Jim and Jan here and elsewhere. Uh, and then eventually clinical trials and eventually another way of replacing uh, uh, defective tissues. Enamel is a complicated tissue and the processes are elegantly described in the literature. Uh, the way the enamel crystals assemble and forming a dentine enamel junction is no small undertaking, but undaunted, a couple of key papers, uh, one out of Japan, came out February 24th, 205, by uh, Dr. Kamagishi and her colleagues on a synthetic enamel that's been fabricated and it's being marketed by GC International in Japan, hasn't gone through FDA yet in the, in the States. And then here at Michigan, Brian Carlson and his colleagues have done a neat project referred to as a cellular synthesis of human enamel-like microstructure, which is opening up a, a yet another, another way of looking at this. We all hear about stem cells, and they've been around since 1953. Well, they've been around forever, but termed in 1953. And uh, uh, as they're moving along, clearly the adult mesenchymal cells that are involved in bone marrow, the mesenchymal population of stem cells in bone marrow, 
uh, as Song Tao Shi making the discovery that they're also found in dental papilla mesenchyme, opening that, periodontal ligament, opening that, dermis, opening that. So adult stem cells are alive and well. Uh, we can do liposuction and download uh, huge numbers of, of mesenchymal stem cells, another very, very exciting area. And OSIRIS Therapeutics in, uh, in Baltimore and that cluster of industries are projecting $500 billion uh, as they move forward. We know that mesenchymal cells could be bone, they could be cartilage, they could be fat, and they can be myocytes. We also know from a paper that just came out that you can manipulate adult cells like keratinocytes or dermal fibroblasts, adding some key informative molecules through transfection, in particular OC4, SOX2, KLF4, and MYC, and produce a, 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 a pluripotential uh, stem cell. So Bob Langer and his crowd at MIT fashioned such mesenchymal stem cells with scaffolds into a nose-like structure, applied it to a patient with nasal cell carcinoma, and got some very interesting results. Hari Reddy and his team at UC Davis have used alginate impressions and have made these molds in the shape of particular bones of interest, filled them with mesenchymal stem cells, conditioned them for osteogenesis, and have made these very interesting bony parts. Uh, and then this paper that I, I found this because it's Michigan. This is a partnership between the University of Michigan and our place, the University of Southern California, paper that came out in December of 2006, and this is called Mesenchymal Stem Cell Mediated Functional Tooth Regeneration Using a Pig Model. Uh, and uh, it is uh, Korea, Japan, China, and American uh, research scientists. And in this paper, they lay out the prospects of making roots that would have osteointegration, periodontal ligament, Sharpies, fibers, you know, all of the good stuff, and then you build a prosthetic appliance on top of them, skipping the metal implant idea and moving to a biomimetic or biological solution to a mechanical problem. Uh, and some of the data sets that are found looking at the histology and the imaging of, of that work. So George Washington wore that gorgeous denture which was made out of gold, ivory, lead, human, and animal teeth, state-of-the-art, best that money could buy uh, in the 18th century. And uh, we are now looking at the possibilities of tooth regeneration at this time. So craniofacial development meets stem cells and tissue engineering, head and neck trauma, head and neck cancer, head and neck birth defects, an awesome number of opportunities for science to drive technology to improve the human condition. And as we live in the nanometer uh, 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 range, uh, a billionth of <clears throat> a, uh, a meter, for those of us who were educated in biochemistry, this doesn't excite us so much because biochemistry has always been around covalent and ionic bonds between sodium and chloride and whatever atom was interesting, and that was always nano, but we never called it nano. Now it is a field of endeavor with literally billions of dollars of being invested. The combination of fiber optics with silicon chips with the ability of picking up individual molecules with so-called tweezers applied to looking at biopsy samples for head and neck cancer. And all of these other things have come together into this lovely, hold it in your hand, uh, handheld device for monitoring something, what you might be interested in. And this is being moved by NSF, NIH, Department of Defense, DARPA, Robert Wood Johnson, Kellogg, I mean, a whole host of people are pushing this technology to be handheld, wireless, and be able to go into the field for applications. Um, DNA has obviously been put on this, so doing genotyping can be done in remote areas using uh, this technology. And so we are living in a transforming climate. And of course, that means pushback and resistance in universities and from the larger publics and the smaller publics, of course. But it also means a, a sort of a glimpse at the possibilities of the 21st century. And they are truly incredible. 
So from my perspective, these areas, for those of you who are postdocs and graduate students and thinking about are there any really hot projects uh, yet to do, uh, they could fill uh, the entire School of Dentistry and beyond. There is no limit except the energy and curiosity and imagination of, of each of us. So as we look at the next 20 years, I hope I can be around for part of that. One never knows. Uh, it is clear that there is a rational intention to move medicine and dentistry to be evidence-based for being able to look at predictable outcomes, to be able to assess value of care versus outcomes, and that field will grow, more people will get invested. The meta-analysis that is being modeled for evaluating the clinical literature will grow, and those attendant issues. Medicine, dentistry, pharmacy, nursing, and the allied health will all go through major revisions in the next 20 years. They cannot stay the same. They're not affordable, they're not sustainable, they are replete with opportunities for reinvention, rethinking, refiguring. Risk assessment, health promotion, health literacy will continue to grow, especially as our country, if you happen to live in Los Angeles or Oakland or Detroit or Chicago or Boston or New York or Atlanta, and we tolerate 30%, 40%, 50% high school dropouts, increasing the pool of people who do not have the remotest chance of being players in the knowledge-based 21st century. So the preschool, K-12, prenatal care, enormous opportunity for significant uh, 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 revisions. Genomics will, of course, be $1,000 a pop and will become part of the normal culture and everybody will want one. They won't know what to do with it, but they will want one. It's a little bit like, I don't have it handy, but like bottled water. It is unbelievable that somebody sold us that we now buy water for more than we pay for gasoline. It is unbelievable, but it's been done. Uh, imaging is so exciting, uh, uh, becoming faster and smarter and, and, and more sensitive so that uh, NIH right now has a prototype where you can look at real-time transcription and translation in an imaging device. It is unbelievable. So the resolution and sensitivity will continue. The industrial countries will keep producing aging people. They'll be very much like my wife and I. We want to be sexually active until we're, I don't know, 95, 105. Uh, we want to skip all chronic debilitating diseases and disorders. And we would prefer to die in our sleep after a lovely dinner party with our loved ones. This is sort of like, this is like the model of the baby boomers who are moving into areas of influence. And although I'm grinning as I'm saying it, I think it's literal. I think it is a very real goal that a lot of folks are, are moving towards. And then obviously, uh, whether Democrat or Republican or Libertarian or Independent, every, we are the only industrial country in the world without some type of universal care. And it is clearly boiled up to the level that most people acknowledge that it's just not working. And if you're paying the premiums and you're a big corporation or university and you're looking at fringe benefits, it's just walking up and up and up. If you look at the gross domestic product of a nation, when you start spending 18 to 25 percent of your GDP for this purpose, it becomes bordering on obscene. And then you look at the world rankings and we rank 19th to 21st in every categories. We spend more and we get less. So clearly it's worth paying attention and stepping up and shaping that as we go forward. So here I'm trying to put the whole thing together. And this is sort of like a glance at a modern medical, dental, pharm a school of pharmacology graduate program in any one of the biomedical sciences. Clearly, we must invest much greater and make it a significant priority in open-ended, fundamental, basic research without a guarantee of return on investment. It must be 
an unconditional investment where it's not driven by, is it gonna give me a greater return in the following quarter, which is the way private sector must think. Then there has to be a rational way to hand the discoveries to another cadre, either on the same team or a different team, who will translate it into a, an appropriate prototype, diagnostic, whatever it is, and then reduce the cost for clinical trials, FDA, all of those sorts of things, and then you do all of that. I'm thinking of, um, I'm thinking of uh, peptic ulcer and all of the work that was done in the 1980s, 90s, and last year the RAND Corporation published that 50% of American physicians do not prescribe antibiotics for peptic ulcers, 50%. So if you don't add continuing education, standard of care, moving the research to the reality of consumer, whether it's the healthcare provider or the patient, it still uh, remains a sort of esoteric. So I think this logic uh, uh, sort of works, it helps me put things in, in sort of a logic moving along. And then if you're in a city like Detroit and you don't really work and you're called the University of Michigan and you're in Ann Arbor, if you don't work up the trust in the community and the community becomes a partner in terms of participating in clinical trials, then you may have every intention in the world to do clinical trials, but without that partnership, it becomes exceedingly difficult. And in Los Angeles, um, we have learned and continue to learn we must invest in the neighborhood community relationships big time if we want to actually demonstrate the reality of clinical research and, uh, and its benefits. So, knowing is not enough, we must do. And all of us in this room are part of tomorrow and we can all make a difference. Thank you very much. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.